next on the OHIO podcast. We talk about the suspension of Marcus Hooker. We review Ryan Day's press conference from Wednesday. And we give our headlines heading into spring ball. And all of that's coming at you right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who win. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast. By fans, for the fans. Where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO Podcast. OH! IO! Welcome back to the OHIO Podcast. I am your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from a beautiful North Central Ohio. It is absolutely gorgeous on this Sunday evening, and I am joined by my co host from Marion, Chris Wilds. Chris, I assume today is just as beautiful in Marion as it is here in Delaware. Oh, man, it's spring. I am ready for it. You know, it was outside, uh, started out the day over, of course, at the Ohio State store. Um, closed down uh, around four, came home, and uh, immediately started cleaning out the garage. Wife had work <laughs> for me to, ready to do outside as soon as I got home. It was great. Yeah, we had some uh, chores yesterday, and uh, today I just spent the day walking around the neighborhood and enjoying this beautiful sunshine. Enjoying the the goodness that God has given us, Chris. I'm so thankful to be in Ohio and thankful that we're coming out of this uh, uh, COVID, I guess. It feels like, Chris, it feels like we're getting closer to it the end. It really does. I mean, I'm a little a little concerned, honestly, that the, uh, the spring breakers may bring through another wave. You know, I saw, uh, saw some reports out of South Beach that they're actually having to impose curfews and, and – uh, Closed down certain areas of the city because of uh, so many people have invaded the town. Um, you know, I hope we I hope we just don't go too too fast too soon because yeah, I'm really ready for this to be over. Me too, me too. And I'll tell you who else is ready. That would be one Ryan Day and the Ohio State football team. Man, they they are ready to get life back to normal over there at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. Of course, Friday. This past Friday was the first day of spring practice, and that is what this show is going to be 100% about, people. Football. That is because basketball has not been too well to us this weekend, Chris. I don't know about you, but my bracket has been busted. Well, yeah, I'll tell you what. It hasn't just been not good to the Ohio State fans. It has not been good to the Big Ten fans. No. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, I mean – my my bracket is is destroyed, of course. Uh, you know, Illinois is the pick. I think all three of us had to win it all is gone. Uh, you know, uh, Texas, who I think uh, myself and Nick had going quite a ways, was gone. So yeah, that and of course Ohio State. As we said, we're not going to get into that right now. But you know, yeah, I think most brackets have taken a pretty brutal beating here. Yeah. As uh, COVID, I think is. Sound would put its mark on the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's. I think Nick had Virginia in the final four too. He had Virginia in the final game. Oh, ugh. Uh, I, I can't. I can't really. I, I haven't been much better. But uh, well, right now leading the charge, there is a two-way race. Uh, Travis Jordan is in the lead with 270 points at this moment. He is tied with Big Poopy's bracket. <laughs> I love know. it. I don't even know who it is, but Big Poopy. 
Uh, here's the thing, though. They both got Illinois winning it all, and that's not good because right behind them in second place is Cherry Bomb and Junior. I don't know who these guys are either. We'll have to figure out who you all are. Uh, they're at 260. They both got Gonzaga winning it, so there is still a chance, they said. Uh, thankfully, I'm just not in last place. I'll take that. Um, that belongs to our Penn State fan, Kevin. Kevin, we are. That's who that is. Yeah, he's in last place. He started poor off. Kevin just can't win this year. Oh, poor Kevin. He's probably listening to this. He's going to get mad at me. <laughs> but he was like, hey, man, I've never won one. And he was in first place for like a hot minute. And I was like, hey, this might be your year. And then he sends me a, a screenshot where he's like, no, no, it's not. But anyways, uh, my bracket's not doing too hot. And uh, you're you're just a couple games ahead of me right now, Chris. You are beating me. And Nick both. So you are in the lead between the three of us. And I'm not surprised with how good you did in the Big Ten tournament. So uh, we'll see if that holds true uh, in the next coming weeks. And if Dr- Travis Jordan and Big Poopy's bracket <laughs> can hold on for uh, the, the win. Or if Junior or Cherry Bomb can come up and snatch them. Also, there was a, a person who will go, will go nameless here. Because I don't know who it is. It's just an ESPN fan. He picked Michigan, whoever this person is. So he's got a shot, too, if uh, if they can hold it up. And, of course, the man who's sponsoring this entire bracket challenge, um, Nick Hickman from Mastermind, he picked Iowa. So uh, he's got a chance, too. So we shall see what happens with this bracket challenge uh, sponsored by Mastermind. Big news before we even got into uh, spring Football over at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. News came down that Marcus Hooker was suspended due to an OVI incident, Chris. Uh, Let's kick it off with this first today. Um, When I read this, I responded with, I think Coach Day did the right thing here. Now, a couple pieces of information before I kick it over to you and let you uh, respond to this. This is Marcus Hooker's second incident like this. However, The first one came when he was a senior in high school, and so he was suspended coming into his freshman year for a game by Urban Meyer because of what had happened when he had uh, happened in high school before he was a part of the team. This is his first incident as a true Buckeye, a part of the team, but second that's being counted against him since he has been a part of the program as a whole. Um. Did Ryan Day handle this correctly in your mind, Chris? And where do you think we go from here with Marcus Hooker? Well, as you said, this is his second uh, time being charged with an OVI. Um, The first one being in 2018. There's a big difference here. I I do think that initially Ryan Day has handled this in the proper manner as he's letting the kind of the, the legal matter play itself out and having him suspended at this time. Um, that being said, I think Hooker's latest incident uh, shows not only a serious lapse in judgment, also in maturity. And I think it shows a bit too that he, I mean, this isn't like the first incident. The first incident was a case of um, underage drinking. You got pulled over, you know, a little bit of weaving on the road going on. This wasn't that incident. I mean, the guy was unresponsive in a McDonald's drive through with his foot on the brake and the car in drive. Um, police officers got there. They had to break into the vehicle, break the window out to unlock the door and remove him from the vehicle because attempts to um, wake him up just weren't working. I think this shows that there's probably more of a problem there um, th- than just you know, a kid who got a little over exuberant at a party. Um, So, yeah, I think that Ryan Day initially has handled it in the proper manner. However, I do think that a much more serious punishment needs to be taken in in this circumstance. I think we need to see him have at least a one-year suspension with a requirement of, you know, going through completion of an intensive uh, rehabilitation program and or possibly, uh, you know, being dismissed from the program altogether. OVI does not necessarily mean intoxicated by alcohol. Exactly. Okay. So 
let let the, uh, understand that. I think uh, instantly when anybody sees um, OVI, they instantly go to drinking and driving, and that's not always the case here. Given his uh, his inability to respond in the drive through, like you mentioned, Chris, that points to me to a different substance of some kind other than I alcohol agree. here. Okay, not that alcohol is quote unquote not as bad. Okay, um, it is legal. For him, since I believe he is 21 years old, under the right circumstances, obviously not while driving, but you get my point here, okay? Right. Uh, whatever he was a part of is illegal. That is that is blatantly obvious here. Um, <clears throat> so I think sometimes people jump to conclusions based off of just past experiences with things, and so a lot of people instantly are, oh, he's it was drinking and driving second time, he needs to be done. Um, I think Ryan Day is handling this very well here. Um, he's He deflected everything by basically saying, hey, look, I'm not going to respond to this because I don't know all the details. We're going to wait to have the details to come in so that we know exactly how that we need to help Marcus in whatever situation he is dealing with here. OK, this goes beyond football, Chris. OK, I agree 100 percent. This is a young man's life who obviously he's making some decisions that are affecting him negatively, and that is more important than football. And I think Ryan Day's the type of person who will protect his football team by upholding standards, but at the same time won't just throw people away to the side. And I think that is a very delicate thing to do, and it's not a very easy thing to do for coaches because at the end of the day, these coaches are expected to win football games, period. That's it. You win football games. And whether they do that by using great standards or not, um, that's how they're going to be judged. That's how they're going to either get contracts or be fired based on wins and losses. But beyond that contractual sentence if you will in in their in their contract or that standard in their contract these guys are human beings and these coaches truly care about these kids i really believe that a good coach will and i think ryan day truly cares about marcus and so although he you know marcus has been suspended from team activities and has been removed from the team i don't think marcus has been removed from ryan day's life if that makes sense chris absolutely no, no, I, I understand completely. And I, and I agree with you that this definitely, um, you know, this definitely is beyond the scope of football. Um, because I really feel that, you know, given the, the situation in which they found him, and, you know, I'm not sure if, if you're aware of this or not, but um, we, we know I work at the Ohio State store, but my primary uh, employer is a counseling center where we deal with, you know, issues of addiction and mental health on a regular basis. And, and I think this, this young man is definitely showing some, some signs that there's, there's some underlying issues that cause this, this, you know, circumstance. So, yeah, I definitely believe that. And as I mentioned, I do think, you know, a one year suspension is not, I, I don't think that's overstepping if during that time he's getting help, if he's in an intensive rehabilitation program that help is helping him get his life back on track. If that were to happen, I would have no problem with him returning to the program. Um, if he's not willing to do this, and given the fact that this is, you know, it, it is kind of a, a black eye for the program, uh, you know, if he's not willing to to take those steps to help himself, it may be time for a, a dismissal from the program. Yeah, I agree. And there's and there's something about that that's very interesting that you bring up, Chris. And I want to touch on this a little bit. And here we we got into this discussion. It was either a week or two ago about the transfer portal. Yeah. Here's where the transfer portal is a really bad thing, in my opinion, because if he just looks at this like, well, shoot, if you're not going to let me play, I'm just going to transfer and go somewhere else. That doesn't correct the issue here. Right. It's just, it's basically just putting a bandaid on it on a on a bleeding wound. And he goes to another another program. Now, now I understand change of scenario or scenery might be good for someone in a situation like this. But if you don't think he's going to run into the same issues on another campus, you've got another thing coming to you, brother. 
I mean, it hits yeah. everywhere. Yeah, he, you he, know? Is a, he is a quality player. Yes, he had some, some missteps last year, but he is a quality player, so he's going to be attracted to a quality program, and he's going to face you know many of the same type of situations that he would have in Columbus. So I don't, you know, with the exception of maybe having to live in his brother's footsteps, you know, you, you know or, or in his right. shadow. And I would be I would be really interested, Chris, if if whoever ends up counseling him in this situation, if they don't end up getting to that point that you just brought up right there, because as a as a younger brother who is following a very successful older brother and going to the same program as that older brother, the the expectations that were placed on Marcus might have been unfair. Let's be honest. I, I mean. Malik was one of the greatest safeties in Ohio State history as far as a single season ever, okay? And and to place those expectations on Marcus, you know, who knows? Maybe that pressure gets to him, and he doesn't know how to handle that pressure, and so he, he instantly goes to a negative way to deal with it as opposed to a positive way to deal with it. And, you know, it would be very interesting to me if that was maybe some of the underlining issues here, Chris. It's not out of the realm of possibility. So, yeah, I mean, I and and like Ryan Day said at this point, I think that before we pass judgment, we all need to sit back and wait for for the exact you know facts of the case to completely come out. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that Day is handling it properly um, to this point, and I'm just curious to see once the actual legal battle plays itself out exactly where we go from here. Yeah, I agree. So if I understand you right, you say don't kick him off the team. Let's give him an opportunity to get to right the ship over the next year and see if he can work his way back onto the team. Yeah, as, as long as he's willing to do what is necessary to help himself off the field, then let's give him a chance to get back on the field. If he's okay. not willing to, to, to take the, make that uh, effort, then I think Ryan Day needs to come out here and make a strong statement and say, you know what, yeah, you, you, you were a black eye to to the program. You did not try to help yourself, no matter how much support we gave you. I think it's time that we move on. So this was our Facebook poll question of the week. Given the news of Marcus Hooker's OVI, should Ryan Day kick Hooker off of the team? Your options were yes, make a statement, or no, give him another chance. This was one of our uh, highest ever voted on polls, uh, interestingly enough, Chris. And uh, it was awful close, too. And there were a lot of comments uh, that were placed uh, in, in the comment section below the poll, which uh, I want to thank each and every single one of you who took the time to not only vote on this poll, but then to to make a comment on it. And I read through all of them, all 33 comments on our on our uh, Facebook page and very good, very, very insightful. A lot of you making very good arguments for or against as to whether Ryan Day should kick him off the team. Uh, let's be let's be uh, totally uh, clear here. Ryan Day has not kicked Marcus Hooker off the team as at this moment. He has suspended him indefinitely at this moment, meaning until he knows everything and ev- and everything is in place, he's not with the team and he's not welcome to be with the team, but he has not been kicked off the team, okay? Um, which some might argue that he's already been kicked off the team. That it, it, No, it, Ryan Day has not said to Marcus, don't ever come back. Those words haven't come yet, okay? Um, that being said, there were uh, – let's see. I'm going to do the, the, the math here real quick, uh, Chris. Um, there were a total of – looks like 102 votes. And the winning percentage here was 57%. So – 57% of you to 43% of you. 57 voted no, give him another chance. 43 of you voted yes, make a statement. All right. So I'm assuming, Chris, based off of your comments, that you went with the 58 other people or the 57% who said give him another chance. Actually, no. Initially, I did not. Okay. So I actually initially had had – went for go ahead and make a statement 
But the more I read into the circumstances of what happened, I kind of shifted my direction because I, much like you had pointed out, had realized this was something more than just, and most likely was something more than just a incidence of simple, you know, drunk driving. And yeah, as, you know, I heard the details come out more. It sounded more like there is a serious underlying problem there. So I am, am much more in favor of them, you know, doing what they can to help the young man, see if he can get his get his life straight and uh, give him another opportunity. Because if he does have serious issues going on that are an underlying underlying cause of this, kicking him off is going to do nothing but either drive him to another program where he's going to continue the behavior or push him further into possibly push him further into a darker place. So I, I really, as, as I got, as I said, as the, the facts, I became more aware of them. I kind of shifted towards the, uh, you know, give him another chance. Yeah. You know what? You've convinced me because I was on the other, I was also on the other uh, fence of this argument too. And there's a comment by, um, it looks like Edmund Furist or first, uh, F-U-E-R-S-T. Sorry, Ed, if I didn't pronounce your last name correctly. Very insightful comment, and I want to read this because I think he really hits this nail on the head here. He says, keep him on the team, but don't ever let him play. Force him to go to extra study halls, academic things. Basically, hug him closer, but no game reps, which I'm sure is what he wants most from Ohio State. I think Ed actually you know, makes a, makes a very good point here saying, hey, look – I like how he said, hug him close. Yes. It's obvious that this kid needs needs something, you know? This young man needs something, some attention. And I think Ed really hits kind of the spirit of what you were talking about, Chris, and that he needs he needs to feel that love. Now, obviously, I understand these coaches have a job to do. They've got to prepare for the 2021 season. But if Ryan Day can show him love by getting him the help he needs and then welcome him back into the program – after he gets that help and he makes those corrections, then it's a success story. And Ryan Day looks like a genius. You know what I'm saying? He looks genuine. He looks real, yeah. which I think he is. I so, do it, so it can it can it can be a positive thing too here. Plus, Marcus could be one of those guys who comes back has a a good finish to the end of his career and basically can look at these younger guys and say, "Look, don't do it the way I did it. Make the right decisions from the get go." And that way you won't be in my shoes. Interesting, though. Thank you, everybody, for participating in that poll. All right. We're going to take a quick commercial break here. I know it's a little bit early, but when we come back, we've got so much to dive into. Chris and I are going to be talking about Ryan Day's press conference on Wednesday as he previewed spring practice. And then we're going to talk uh, about the headlines heading into spring football. Chris and I have written down headlines that we want to respond to one another each on and see what uh, what we think about those headlines as we prepare for the coming weeks, about the next three weeks of spring football, Chris, heading into the spring game and then into summer camp as we prepare for the 2021 Ohio State football season. So hang tight, everybody. The OHIO podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everyone. All right, Chris, let's dive right into Ryan Day's press conference on Wednesday. He gave the media um, via Zoom again. Gosh, I, I know the media members probably can't wait to get back in person again. But um, via Zoom, he gave them a press conference. It was about 30-minute uh, press conference on Wednesday, basically answering all their questions and previewing the Spring season, the spring, he laid it all out for them, what they can expect in spring practices, the spring game, heading into summer camp, and all of that stat, and all of that jazz. Interestingly enough, okay, I have been wrong about the tight ends now. I thought for sure Luke Farrell and Jake Hausman were coming back. They were taking advantage of that extra year that the NCAA granted 
seniors who wanted to come back because of COVID. That's not the case. They left, um, which right. is interesting to me because I saw nothing on social media from them where they were announcing that they had left. I completely missed that somehow. Um, Jake Hausman leaving doesn't really hurt us too bad. He didn't play all that much. He was a third string tight end. Losing Luke Farrell's big, and gosh, boy, doesn't that make Jeremy Ruckert coming back a really big deal now because both Luke Farrell and Jake Hausman aren't on this roster anymore. So, interestingly enough, I wanted to point that out because Ryan Day brought up, through questioning, the race on who would be the backup or the second string tight end. And really, that second string tight end is really a first string tight end because Ryan Day says we might not run as much 12 personnel, which is where you have two tight ends on the field at the same time, as we have in the past. But it's in our playbook, and there will be situations that we need to run two tight ends. And so we need to have that second tight end ready to go. And that was one thing that really jumped out at me, Chris, uh, uh, during his press conference was him talking about that tight end. I really think that Ryan Day wants to incorporate a tight end into this offense more than we have ever seen before at Ohio State. And I'm sure that that's his NFL background speaking to that, Chris. But obviously my mind goes right to Cade Stover right off the bat. The big boy from Richland County who came in as a linebacker, moved the defensive end, moved the tight end at the end of last year. Phenomenal athlete. I think Kate Stover's got a really good chance here of making some noise and becoming that Jake Hausman type of blocking tight end um, and giving Jeremy Rucker a, someone else to kind of bounce off of a little bit too. And another wrinkle in that Ohio State offense in the playbook that Ryan Day likes to run with those tight ends, especially when he, he splits Rucker out wide and then in the second tight end kind of goes in a crossing route across the middle and, and the defense just wasn't expecting that. Your thoughts on the tight end race and the fact that it's important enough for Ryan Day that he brings it up in his press conference heading into spring football, Chris. Well, I'll tell you, I, I agree with you. I think Stover's got to be the guy. He's, you know, he's, he's been there. He's got a little bit of uh, experience with the system. Big athletic guy, six foot four, 255. You know, I, I don't know. I don't see him, like you said, as a, as a big pass-catching tight end. He's going to be that guy who maybe hits some of that smaller stuff across the middle. But, man, he's going to hit like a lineman when he's out there. He is just going to help that run game tremendously. And I think he is going to be that number two tight end, like you said, that, uh, you know, definitely free, frees up uh, Rucker to, to, to take those – those seam routes down the middle and, uh, you know, make his way downfield. Um, you know, we have a couple of other nice guys coming in, but I think Stover right now is definitely the number two. Yeah, Sam Hart's going to get some playing time as a freshman. Joe Royer's now in his second year on the team, but Kate yeah. Stover's in his third year. Uh, he's a redshirt sophomore. It's time, it's time for Kate Stover to get on the field, and I think that they found the position for him to do that, and I'm excited uh, to see – how that plays out for him, um, no doubt about that. How, what about one of your takeaways from the press conference before I, I give another one? I want to hear what kind of jumped out at you. Well, I'll tell you, one of the big things that jumped out at me was the, the, the Zach Harrison talk, you know. I think maybe he's ready to take that next step. We've all been waiting for it to happen. You know, I heard Coach Day comment on um, the, the work that, that Harrison has put in this offseason – um, you know, he's made particular note of, of his physical change in his body, being able to just see that, uh, his work ethic, and just the fact that he's got a different look in his eyes. But he's, he's more hungry. Maybe he's got a different mental approach to the game. Maybe it has to do with the focus. But, you know, both he and Kerry Combs have noted this, and I'll tell you, that's got me really excited about what we're going to see out of Zach Harrison this year. Yeah. Um, did you see the photo of him? During oh my workouts. goodness, that that's ridiculous. That is a physical specimen right there. <laughs> Dude looks like a leaner Chase Young. Yes. Uh, minus the dreads, obviously. Um, so I remember when Zach Harrison. I'm going to talk on Zach for a minute because I got to see him play in high school uh, a little bit. So <clears throat> Zach Harrison 
was a freak of nature. He was just bigger, stronger, faster than everyone, Chris, on the football field. He was a track star, a defensive end who was so fast, he was running the 100-yard dash in track and was going to, like, state. I mean, that's how athletic. He was just a freak athlete, which is why he got the five-star ranking as a high schooler. But the thing on him was that he was really raw, okay? So he comes into Ohio State, and he's the next big five-star defensive end following in the footsteps of Joey and Nick Bosa and Chase Young, right? Unfair expectations. That's probably what we should probably put the title of this show right now is unfair expectations placed on young guys. Um, Comes in. He flashed at times as a freshman, if you recall, a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And we all thought last offseason, Chris, Aaron and I both did, that he was going to be the next big superstar at Ohio State. And it didn't happen. He didn't start at the beginning of the year. He hardly played at the beginning of the year. Now, by the end of the year, he was in there in the rotation, taking about 50% of the snaps opposite Jonathan Cooper on the other side of the defense. But... In that game against Alabama, I watched him a lot because he, you know, he he was one of the ones that had to step up, and he just didn't have the versatile moves that the Chase Youngs and the Bosa did. Which goes back to my original statement of him coming out of high school was he was extremely raw. Some guys, it just takes more time to develop. The Bosas were groomed. From the time they were like be able to walk to be defensive ends, okay, they had they had daddies and uncles who played in the NFL who were teaching them technique, okay, and, and pee wee football on how to get to the quarterback here, okay. Um, so they they came in ready made, and Chase Young, I think he had some really good coaching in high school as well. Not that Zach Harrison didn't have good coaching. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying he was just more raw than those other three guys, and it's just taking him more time to develop. But it sure sounds like he is developing really well this offseason, and it sounds like to me, Chris, that he kind of took to heart whatever was happening last offseason to where he didn't get to play very much, and he is he has brought it because not only did Ryan Day bring him up, but Kerry Combs brought him up that he has shown tremendous Leadership, leadership yes. this offseason. And that screams he is taking a next step for me. That's exciting stuff right there, Chris. Oh, it is. Because, as you said, I think you, Aaron, and I may have all predicted him to lead the team in sacks last year. At the, the, the preseason show, if I recall. Or at least two of the three of us did. So, I'll tell you, I, I think that I think that this is it. I think this is his year. I think we're finally going to see what he's capable of. Um, you know, just I'm super psyched about uh, about what I heard in the press conference, what I heard from Kerry Combs. I mean, it's just, it's exciting. All right. Here's my other takeaway from the press conference here. Ryan Day was asked about the quarterbacks. And boy, this is, this. Yes. we're going to get it. We're going to get into this, okay? This is probably going to be the number one A1 topic all offseason we're all going to talk about, right? And I cannot wait, Chris, to watch the spring game and see for my own self, with my own eyes, these three guys in the spring game, see what I like and what I don't like. So Ryan Day was asked, what are you looking for in picking a starting quarterback? When you pick a starter at quarterback, what are you looking for? If you recall... Um, Urban Meyer's philosophy on the starting quarterback was like very different than what most people would. In fact, I think he put like toughness and running ability ahead of throwing the football, if you recall. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ryan Day mentioned the following. He said, number one for me for a quarterback is leadership. Yes. Okay. Let's stop right there before we get into anything else about his statement about quarterbacks because there is a couple other things he brought out that we're going to talk about but let's start with leadership 
One of the things that you and I can't see and the media can't see, and you're not going to hear it from any other OSU podcast because they can't see it either unless there is somebody in the program who gives them you know, information, inside information that they then can report on. We don't know who is going to possess or show that great leadership because it's not something that is, is seen in a practice, okay? It's seen in a locker room. It's seen in a huddle. The guys will tell you. The players will tell you who the leader is when it comes to leadership. Who will they follow into battle? Justin Fields had that kind of leadership. It was a calm leadership, okay? Um, JT Barrett had that leadership. As much as I um, think that JT Barrett is really overrated, he was a really good leader, Chris. Absolutely. Um I think it's, it is very insightful that Ryan Day, the first thing he mentioned, it wasn't arm strength. It wasn't accuracy. It wasn't footwork. It wasn't speed. It wasn't learning the playbook. It wasn't intelligence. He said leadership. Who's the leader? Who's the alpha dog, in other words? Who's the man? That is insightful, and I think that is – one of the most intriguing answers I have heard when from Ryan Day when asked a, a poignant question about this quarterback battle is he first thing he says leadership. Your thoughts, Chris? Well, yeah, I, I think it does. Uh, it says a lot about where we're going, um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with confidence as well. You know, because if, if the quarterback has that confidence in himself. He's going to be a stronger leader. If he's got confidence in himself, the other players are going to have confidence in him. The coaches are going to have confidence in him. Um, so I think that a lot of what, what we can speculate on is, you know, from what we've seen, who has that confidence when they get to get out there? And that may per- be the person who has the upper hand going into this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so for, for me, I think that that – Leadership is going to be important, especially on a team that, while we have a great offensive line returning and we have a few really good uh, defensive linemen returning, we are still a fairly young team. Yeah. Again. Yeah. So that that leadership, that person who can step up and say, "Follow me, and I'm going to show you where to go," you know, that's the person, or, or that's what we're going to need from this mm-hmm. team this year. Who can and, and, shake off their youthfulness and yes. become a leader? That is, yeah, you got it. And mm-hmm. another point that he made in that, that same stretch was, and I really love this, he talked about consistency. He talked about, you know, growing from day to day and who can, you know, forget the mistake they made yesterday and yep. correct it tomorrow. Yep, that was my but, next point. <laughs> but but yep. the, the thing I love more than anything, and, and you heard him comparing Tom Brady and Drew Brees and what made them special was having the answers at first. They may not have been the most talented guy on the field. They may not have had the strongest arm. They may not have had the the, the fastest 40 time. But they had the ability to process what they were seeing in a quick manner, and they had the confidence to make the play. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and I think that, you know, him saying leadership, that's what that is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so the next point, you you touched on it. Learn from your mistakes and don't repeat it. So I, I kind of looked at that as adaptability. So yes. all three of these guys are young. These are all – like two of them are like 19 and the other one is 18 years old. Okay, these are, these are young dudes here, guys. None of them have thrown a pass in college football. When we, when we go into Minneapolis next year and take on the Golden Gophers in the first game, which is a Big Ten game on the road to start the season, that's, that's rough, by the way. None of these guys will have thrown a pass in college football. That's, so Ryan Day expects there to be mistakes. He knows that's going to happen. But who can learn from their mistake and then not repeat it? So, so I think what's going to happen He's going to throw these guys in situations that they're not ready for, and they're going to make mistakes. They're going to throw an interception, and he's going to watch, okay, 
will you learn from that so you don't make that same mistake twice? That is one of the big grades, I think, when it comes to choosing who the starter is going to be on who shows that growth and doesn't make the same mistakes over and over again. That, I think, will be big. And then the third thing he brought up, and I loved how you brought it up too with, with Brady and Breeze. How quickly can you have the answers to the test, he said, by studying film and anticipating through film study? Okay, Ryan Day's obviously a quarterback, <laughs> okay? Yeah. He knows exactly what he's talking about when he says that. In other words, in other words, who can look at film and learn on their own without us teaching and holding their hand for everything? Because Ryan Day said, I can't show you everything. You've got to be able to study film and be intelligent enough and to learn it and see it for yourself. So there's part of that intelligence we talked about, that anticipation. This is going to be super interesting to me because I think the person who shows up early, stays late, is seen in the film room, is putting the time in right now, doing going the extra mile, is going to win Ryan Day over. I, I really believe that. Well, I'll tell you, I, I agree, and I also love the fact, something else just touching on the quarterbacks, not maybe the quarterbacks themselves, but, you know, I loved how he really showed, I think, a lot of support for his quarterback coach as well. When they asked him, you know, how do you divide your time, you know? And he basically said, my quarterback coach is coaching the quarterbacks. I'm going to be there, but but, you know, and I'm going to have input, but he really kind of said that, you know, my quarterback coach is coaching the quarterbacks. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that shows not just a lot as far as, you know, he's going to have his hand in it. We know that. But, but I think saying that and showing that not only gives, you know, gives more credibility to his quarterback coach, but I think that says a lot about him developing as a head coach as well. Because I think, as a coordinator, he would have stood there with the, in the quarterback room 90% of the time. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But uh, I really think that that's something that, that, that's huge going forward as well. I agree. Do you have anything else from the press conference you want to touch on? Well, I'll tell you, the one other thing that just kind of stuck out to me, and he said it right towards the beginning of the press conference, you know, they brought up what position battles, um, you know, he was really looking forward to. Everybody knows about the quarterbacks. But, you know, he talked about the linebackers and the fact that we've lost so much productivity there. Uh, the defensive backs, we got seven banks returning. We got, you know, Proctor, who showed flashes, but inconsistency. I really feel like this may be even a more open competition for a lot of positions than maybe we thought initially. Yeah, I agree. Because he had mentioned, we're going to see what happens when we get these young guys on the field. Mm -hmm. So I think we may even see some of these young guys come in, not just get significant time, but we may see one of these freshmen come in and supplant somebody who we may have previously thought was locked in to be a starter. Yeah. You have the three seniors, Taraja Mitchell, Kayvon Pope, and uh, Dallas Gant, right? That, that's yeah. that's who we've all thought have been waiting in the wings, and, and we thought that they were going to play. Um, I don't know if you saw the picture of the number 30. Uh, that's Cody Simon. Yeah. Dude looks like an absolute, uh, beast. Like he is, I don't know what he took in Mickey Marathi's program, but, uh, dude took all of it. Okay. He looks absolutely huge. I mean, he looks, I said, he looks like, he reminds me that of Chris Spielman. He looks like a baby Chris Spielman. Oh, if only. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. You've got court Williams. Uh, yes. You've got the uh, over. I mean, you've got the super athletic Craig Young that is getting a lot of of, of mentions. Then you've got um, often forgotten but was highly recruited Tommy Eichenberg from up there in Cleveland, San Ignatius. Yes, he's been here for a while. He's in the he's waiting in the wings now. And then you got the super talented Reed Carrico, aka Rambo, that uh, obviously has made a lot of waves. Uh, Coming into the Ohio State program, the coaches love this kid as well. 
This thing is wide open, brother. I mean, I agree with you. I think it's going to be super interesting to see who takes the bull by the horns and can win and win Washington's trust because that's the thing about um, um, Al Washington that we've learned. He's going to play who he trusts, not necessarily who flashes the most, who he trusts. Um, so who, who's going to who's going to garner that trust from him? We shall see. Uh, very good. Let's dive in now to our headlines. So uh, Chris and I have each prepared three headlines. These would be like headlines on a story about spring ball, and then we're going to uh, respond to our headlines. So I'll go first here, Chris, and uh, this is this is about the quarterbacks. My headline is this. Ryan Day holds his cards close to his chest. <laughs> I don't think Ryan Day is going to let us know at the end of spring who's in the lead. I think he's going to say it is still a wide open competition. This competition is going to go through spring into summer, all the way into fall preparations up into the first game. I would not be surprised if we don't know who the starting quarterback is until a day or two right before the opening game kicks off. Well, and I'll go a step further than that. We still may not know the starting quarterback for the season at that point. We might not. I, I kind of feel like um, we're going to, we're going to see what happens. I don't think, as you said, Ryan Day is going to share anything. Part of that being, um, you know, that I think he really wants to make sure he's putting the right guy out there. But the other part of that being, I don't think he wants to lose anybody to the transfer portal before the season starts. Correct. So I agree that we're not going to see anything um, or hear anything out of, out of uh, coach day until at least late August. Um, But you know, at the same time, I would not be surprised if we have a normal season that in in which we have a few of these. um, And again, Minnesota is definitely not a cake game to kick off the season, but in a season where we have some of these, sprinkled in teams that maybe, you know, we should have a good time against. Um, see any, some of these other guys get in. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be real tight to the vest. And I think, it, you know, we are going to have a game one starter announced versus Minnesota, but would it surprise me to see the other guys get in, you know, at least for a few plays? Not at all. So. I agree. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of those deals where it's like, hey, uh, on the third drive, you're going in. It's just pre-planned. Yeah. You know? Um, the fourth drive is all is going to be yours, you know, and just to keep kind of, you know someone here because let's face it, the, all three of these guys are vying for a starter. They all view themselves as starters in college football. I think if one of the two second-year players doesn't get the start, they're gone. So let's let's just hypothetically say CJ Stroud gets the gets the gets the nod as starter. I would expect that the other one transfers. Well, yeah, I can't I can't disagree with that because as much as you want to keep a, a, a deep bench, and I mean look, just look at what having three quality quarterbacks meant to Ohio State back in 2014. And Ryan Day has no doubt used that for his advantage with all three of these guys. But at the same time, yeah. it would not surprise me if Stroud is named quarterback. I would Miller, expect yeah. to see Miller, uh, you know, look elsewhere, especially considering the fact that you've got, uh, you, you know, you got McCord coming in this year. Uh, we got the the kid out of Texas coming in next year. Ewers, you, yep. Ewers. I mean, odds are if one of the two sophomores don't get it this year, they're not going to to see the starting position. Correct. Yeah, because that means so, McCord. That means McCord won the thing, and he's that good, and he's a freshman, which means he's going to start for the next two years, unless somehow yours can knock him out of the starting position. Um, there's so much. There's so much riding on this because if McCord, I mean, hypothetically, if McCord wins the starting position, you could lose. You could lose both Miller and Stroud. And yours could decide to go elsewhere because yeah. he knows I'm not going to start. And now you have one five-star quarterback and then no other quarterbacks at this moment. So 
I mean, I don't know that that's how you make your decision, though. I mean, obviously, if McCord's the best guy for this season, you play him because it's you don't you, you're not promised next season. Gosh, I mean, we might have COVID again, right? It's right. about what's in front of you. And so you got to play the best quarterback in front of you. If that is a true freshman, if that is Kyle McCord, then that's who you play. My anticipation is, though, however, based on my headline I wrote here, he's not going to let them know who he's, he's going to play until week one. I mean, they might kind of get an idea based on reps, but I'm pretty sure he's going to maybe maybe choose two and rep them 50-50. And then one of the other guys is out. He's kind of the right. third stringer. You, you know, that, that I can see happening later on in the season. But, you know, he's talking going in, you know, as we're in spring ball right now. I believe he said he's got, what, 118 guys in camp right now? So he, he's got so many guys in camp that he's running tons of, you know, he's got, he can t- really kind of run three different units at all times. Have basically three practices going for all intents and purposes. Yeah. You know, so all these guys are going to get reps. Yeah. Um, this spring. So I think that there's tremendous opportunity for all of them. Yep. All right. Give me one of your headlines, brother. Okay. Here we go. Um, so we have a returned focus on fundamentals. As we all know, Coach Day had uh, stated uh, he was going to run as many game simulations as he possible uh, mm-hmm. initially with the spring to compensate for all the lost reps last season. However, given the number of young players on the team, Coach Day and his staff has decided that they're going to focus more on fundamentals and do more of a coaching rep 50-50 type blend. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's huge because I think we saw last year, especially given, and I heard Coach Day say it this year, this year he's basically got two freshman classes because they didn't have the time to do those fundamentals last spring. Right. So I think that's going to have a tremendous impact on the the team this season, um, getting back to those fundamentals. Because I think we saw in games where Ohio State didn't look so good, it was fundamental issues at, at the base of it. So yeah. what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Um, I think that there is going to definitely be some game planning as the season moves on where Ryan Day can start to get a little bit more creative. I mean, he obviously is a whiteboard drawler of plays. I mean, he loves the game within the game. He's a chess player, not a checkers player. And what he's saying is he's basically saying, we are in a place right now where these kids can't play chess. We've got to play checkers with them right now. That's him admitting their youthfulness. Um, And that's not necessarily a bad thing, Chris. Like you said, we are a young team. It's a relatively young team. This is what happens when you have so many upperclassmen who played for so long, who've blocked other people from being able to get on the field, number one, and number two, underclassmen who leave early. It creates a team of youthfulness, and that's what we have right now. And so fundamentals aren't a bad thing at this point because what is the number one thing as Ohio State fans we all get upset about is the fundamentals, the lack of fundamentals on defense, tackling. You know, the big play, yes. all of those things. And so I think Ryan Day and Kerry Combs and the defensive coaches have basically looked at the looked at this film and been like, OK, we've got to get back to what the silver bullets do best. And at the heart of what the silver bullets do best best is they keep everything in front of them and they game tackle. They swarm to the football and they don't let you go. Alabama ran all over us we couldn't get our paws on them and that was not silver bullet defense and that is i think is this is a direct response of what happened in the national championship game and sometimes in order to do that you've got to you got to remove all everything and just get to the basics uh i had a, I had a teacher used to always say kiss keep it simple stupid that right. is really what we've got going on here and this leads into my next headline Chris, and so I'll, I'll say this and let you respond because it's, it's really it's, – it's tied in perfectly, perfectly to yours. Kerry Combs gets a full offseason to implement his defense. That is my headline. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I, I think it's huge, and it actually ties in to what my next headline was, oddly enough. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be a big – 
Th- this year he gets a full season. You know, he's got position coaches for everything now. He's not pulling double duty. All right. He gets to institute his defense. Um, he has a full slate of practices to be able to coach these guys up. And I think it's going to be, you know, really big for him to show a marked improvement versus what we had last year. And I think specifically in the secondary um, and, and to an even more extent in the, in the back seven on the defense, because I really think that, uh, you, you know, he brought in, we know he's a good recruiter. We saw that when he was with Ohio state the first time, but th- this year is about showing it on the field. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think that uh, this is definitely a test year for Kerry Combs. Yes, let me hear your headline. I'll, oh, that ties in with this. I'm interested. Kerry Combs will be put to the test. <laughs> that yes, he will. Head- second headline, yeah. <laughs> um, is the – is this a make-or-break year for Kerry Combs, the defensive coordinator? Uh, yes. I agree. I don't think Ryan Day is against cutting ties if it doesn't work. Oh, and let me tell you, he's got another guy on that staff who would love to step into that defensive coordinator spot. Uh, Al Washington? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know that's boy, that's an interesting thing. Would he would he promote from within if that were the case? If there is a total, if there is no improvement on the defensive front this year, obviously the Kerry Combs project is is didn't work. Now, let me say this: Kerry Combs was a heck of a defensive backs coach, man. He is an awesome recruiter. And you don't put five consecutive first-round draft picks in the defensive back in the NFL if you don't know what you're doing, okay? Right. He knows what he's doing. Is he is he over his head as a coordinator? That's the question. And I think we're going to find out. I don't think he is because I think last year, given the way the spring practice fell apart because of COVID and the fact that it was off again, on again, due to the, the the dumb management of Kevin Warren in the Big Ten, I think a lot of things were stacked up against Kerry Combs. And I want to give him, personally, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, let's give him a full off season and allow him to implement his complete defense. I think he can succeed. That's how I view it, Chris. But I'm with you. If it fails again, I I'll I'll be calling for his uh his head as well. Yeah, I, I mean, and and let's let's call it what it is. You know, this is the Ohio State University. You know, nothing less than a Big Ten title and playing for the college football playoff every year is acceptable. And what we saw in that defense last year, and and again, I'm going to give Pat Combs somewhat of a pass on that given the circumstances we were playing under. But if he comes in and he implements his defense, if he puts his mark on that team this year, and we still see the same shortcomings, we still see guys out of position, we see undisciplined play, I don't think they, you know, is going to tolerate that for another season. I agree. All right, my third, third and final headline, Chris. Here we go. The offensive line leads the way. I think this offensive line is going to be real good. Hold on. Wait for it. If not better than last year. I think this offensive line is going to be the best offensive line in the nation. I think that this, the the talent we've got coming back, the veteran leadership, the young guys stepping in, uh, you know, the, the versatility of these guys, and we heard Coach Day in his press conference talk a little bit about the versatility, how our tackles can play guard, our guards can play tackle. Um, you know, we've got a guy presume, you know, presumably playing, going to play center, his natural position, who's played guard. So, I mean, these guys are interchangeable, um, which means, granted, there's going to be a little bit of a step down possibly when you hit that second, third tier. But we really should not miss a beat with this offensive line 
uh, given the guys that we have out there. I agree. Yes. I think this team, this line has potential to be better than last year's line, which last year's line was absolutely amazing. Yeah, it was a really think, good offensive line. There was no doubt about that. We I we've think, we've run this is I feel like this is the third consecutive year where we've got a really gosh darn good offensive line in a row. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, we're going to need it because while we've got a lot of talent in the quarterback room and a lot of talent in the running back room, outside of Master Teague, we don't have a lot of experience in either room. So we're going to need that line to really, you know, block, you know, block the guys, keep the pass rush off these young quarterbacks, give them time. And we're going to need guys who can just blast open those holes. And I definitely think we got the lot of guys on that line out there to do it. There Munford, third year starter, left tackle senior. Um, we have penciled in Matthew Jones as left guard. Yes. Um, however, Dewan Jones has gotten a little bit of play there. I've heard about Ryan Jacoby uh, as another name that is, is someone who might, you know, compete for this. And don't discount true freshman Donovan Jackson as well. Yes. Harry Miller slides over to center, maybe. Right. Also, Matthew Jones can play center. Um, uh, Ryan, is it Ryan Jacoby or Luke Whipler? One of the two are also Whipler. a center. Whipler's a center, possibly. It's not. It is not etched in stone that Harry Miller is going to start on this offensive line, even though he started the season last year at left guard. Well, we don't know 100% who's going to start where because, as you heard in the press conference, Paris Johnson's going to start at guard. Yeah. But is he going to be slid out to tackle and maybe have somebody slide into guard? Um, you know, yeah, so and, and that is options. that is they're moving Paris Johnson to guard because he's one of the best five linemen, and you want to get the best five on the field. But right. there, Munford and Nicholas Petit Frere are both senior starter tackles. So obviously, Paris Johnson. In order, I think if one of them goes down with an injury, boom, Paris Johnson immediately becomes that starter right there. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, this offensive line is just road graders, dude. They are big, nasty, strong, experienced young men who could lead this team to a national championship. If you go back to our last national championship in 2014, how we did that sucker was up front in the offensive line. Yes, we had Michael Thomas and we had, uh, you know, we had great receivers and, 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 and we, you know, we had three starting quarterbacks, in other words, you know, and we had all of those things going for us. And of course we had Zeke Elliott. Yes, I, I got that. But that team offensively was just manhandling their opponents at the end of the season on the offensive line. We moved the line of scrimmage against Alabama at the end of that game. We were blowing them off the ball by five to seven yards. And there was yeah. nothing we could do about it. That is what I, that is, it wins champions. Running the football still wins championships. Okay. And if you have an offensive line that can do that, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to beat Ohio State this year despite having a young quarterback. And then you put into that equation that you just said there, Chris, some of this young running back talent. And if there's one position where youthfulness ne isn't necessarily a big issue, it's at running back. It's see hole, hit hole, run real fast, you know, make it happen, right? <laughs> it's, it's more about your athleticism than it is truly X's and O's. However, there are a lot of X's and O's in the running back position. I know that, especially when it comes to blocking in the passing game and things, which is why Master Teague will get the start to start the year. He's going to be your best blocker at running back, which is going to be very important for a young quarterback. But when it comes to running the football late in the football game, do not be shocked if it's Mayan Williams or... Travion Henderson, or can't forget this guy, Marcus Crowley. What if he's healthy? We got yeah. so much running back talent. It's ridiculous. But I'm with you. It's all up front, man. The offensive line is going to be what leads the way for us this year. And I think that starts this offseason right now, Chris. 
give yeah. me your give me your other headline, brother. Ohio State freshmen arrive early on campus. So we've had uh, McCord, uh, uh, Ibuka, Henderson, a lot of these guys um, who have arrived on campus early. Um, you know, they've, uh, according to Coach Day, they, they've, you know, really handled well the, the strength and training portion of, of the early start to, to football here. Um, so we got a lot of four and five star recruits on on campus. They're they're going to get the opportunity uh, here in spring ball to really see a lot of uh, a lot of reps early, I think. And uh, with the potential return to that that six deep at wide receiver, you know, I think a lot of these guys are going to benefit from coming in early. Uh, but my question to you: Who do you think has the best advantage coming in? <sighs> As a freshman, which freshman coming in has the best advantage? Ooh. I mean, we heard we heard uh, Coach Day did member uh, did mention um, Henderson he, a little uh, bit in the press well, conference. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll I'll tell you what grabbed my attention and surprised me. Okay, we have three very talented wide receivers in this class again. Coming off the heels of getting four, right? right. You've got Emeka Egbuka, who was the number one wide receiver from the state of Washington. Um, you've got Jaden Ballard, who was the number one wide receiver from the state of Ohio. But then the name Marvin Harrison should Harrison. ring a bell with everybody, yep. right? Marvin Harrison Jr., the number one wide receiver from the state of Pennsylvania, the son of Hall of Famer Marvin Harrison. And when asked by the media which freshman kind of jumps out at you, jumped out at you this oh, during winter conditioning, that's who he mentioned was Marvin Harrison Jr. I don't know which freshman will kind of become that 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 uh, Jackson Smith and the Jigba type of freshman who makes a, a, a moment or a splash that's like, oh, this guy's got a really good future. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's not him. And, I'll tell you, I think there's an opportunity for multiple to do it. With, with the I guess, again, he mentioned the return to the six, the six man rotation. So. Right, right. I mean, obviously, Olave and Wilson are are your go tos. I would not be shocked if Fleming or Smith Najigba replace uh, Jamison Williams as that number three in the in the starting rotation. Yeah. Um, he just didn't do it for me last year as much. Um, we'll see if maybe he can jump back from that. I expect big things from Julian Fleming this year. I think you're going to see a big step from him from his freshman to sophomore year. Of course, Jackson Smith, the Jigba is just his body control is unworldly. And we never got to really see G Scott much. Be interesting to see now that he's been on campus for a year, if he can take that step because the thing on him coming out of high school was he was the best route runner out of all of them. And, and that, that kind of, that kind of falls into the mold of a Chris Olave. Chris Olave is not the fastest. He's not the tallest. He's most, not the most athletic. He's not the strongest. He's by far the best route runner I have seen at Ohio state in a long, long time. In fact, I think he's better. And I know I'm, I'm probably about to get hate mail from this. I think he's better of a route runner at this point in college than what Michael Thomas was. And Michael Thomas is a phenomenal route runner, the best in the NFL yeah. right now. But I think at this point, given what I have seen with my own two eyes, Chris Olave is better right now than what Michael Thomas was when he was uh, at his later stages in his college career. That does not mean Chris Olave is going to go on and become the next Michael Thomas in the NFL. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is Chris Olave is the best route runner I have seen in a long, long time at Ohio State. Um, and to say G. Scott's the best coming out of high school since Olave means I think he's got the potential to do that. But as far as freshmen are concerned, I'll give you one offense, one defense. My offense one is Marvin Harrison Jr. On defense, I think that there is an opportunity for one of these these defensive backfield cornerbacks to make a splash. And I think Andre Turrentine has that opportunity. He was the highest ranked out of the freshman cornerbacks that we – that we went after uh, he's safety slash cornerback. The, the, the backfield is wide open. It is wide open. 
And if one of them can step up and take, you know, take the bull by the horns, grab the football and say, I'm going to be a starter, that could happen. That absolutely could happen. But that's kind of who I've I'm, got my eyes on a little bit. Uh, maybe Ja'Kalen Johnson, a cornerback, also. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a freshman. One of those two guys might might do it. That's a good question. Um, I'll, I know this much, though. I know everybody thinks right off the bat Travion Henderson, right? Don't look for it in the spring game. Spring games are not for running backs, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, we, we saw what happened with Master Teague last year early on. I mean, that was, what, the first day of practice last year. Yeah, but I, yeah, I mean, but when you, you know, when you watch when you watch those uh, spring games, it's like two hand tap a lot of times until they get into like the third strings, and then it's like you know, then they finally let them start tackling. Um, yeah, they're protecting their they're protecting their guys. So I don't expect Travion Henderson to just wow the crowd with his running ability, right? That's just not going to happen. What I am looking forward to though is I'm looking forward to Kyle McCord throwing the football. That is what I'm looking forward to. I want to see that with my own two eyes, definitely. I want to see any of them throw the football. Yeah. We haven't I mean, seen it I yet. I want to see somebody <laughs> throw the football so I, I, so I know who's going to be the quarterback next year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Great headlines, Chris. That was a lot of fun, dude. We do that every year heading into spring, spring football. Next week, Chris and I, for our next podcast, are actually going to do basketball, but we're not going to do it on the weekend. We are going to have a basketball-only podcast where we talk about this season and what has transpired since the loss to Oral Roberts has been dumbfounding to me uh, on social media. Disgraceful. Embarrassing, actually. Um, Yeah. The game was embarrassing, and then the response by some of those in the fan base has been embarrassing. Both. Both have been embarrassing. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about this team. We're going to talk about Chris Holtman. Should he be on the hot seat next year or not? We have a lot to dive into with that. We're going to do that on a midweek show, just kind of wrap up basketball since we do talk about it a little bit. Obviously, 90% of this podcast is almost always football. Um, But when the football season's over and the basketball team's playing, it's kind of hard not to talk about them. So we'll do that um, as a special show. That way, if you don't want to hear about football, you don't have to listen to it. Or excuse me, about basketball. You don't have to listen to it. And then next weekend, what we're going to get into here, Chris, is we're going to get into our top 10 Buckeyes heading into spring ball. The top 10 Buckeyes list. We always do that as well every spring. Which Buckeyes do we rank from 1 to 10? Um that way you have an idea of who you need to keep your eye on as well this spring, which should be very interesting because, I mean, it was obvious last year who, like, the top three were, I mean, just based off of the talent that you had. Um, this year it could be some questioning. We could have very different lists when we do that. Also, keep your eye on the following. We are going to have uh, something special. Every off season we want to do a, something a little bit different. Uh, last year we had, like, a, a – tag team wrestling tournament thing that we did that was a lot of fun a lot of you enjoyed that we might do that again this year i don't know if you're into wrestling or not chris i i, I don't anymore oh, i don't yeah. watch are you okay i don't watch well, anymore i haven't but... watched in a while yeah i mean but yeah I, I used to be really heavy into it. oh yeah i was i was too but uh we might do that again but what we are going to do chris and i are going to get into the march madness thing but we're going to do it with movies i i am a i'm a movie buff i love movies it's one of my passions is to just watch movies i've watched way too many i've got way too big of a dvd collection that's for sure and uh, we're going to do a 64 movie bracket that we are breaking into four different categories four different brackets to get down to the number one sports movie uh this off season and so the brackets are going to be football basketball baseball and then miscellaneous sports movies so your golf movies your racing movies uh any other sports, basketball, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> uh, any any one of those type of uh, movies. Uh, and dodgeball. We'll, dodgeball, <laughs> gosh, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll come up with a list of 64 movies, and we're going to put them in a bracket. Um, I'm probably going to use the site Flick Chart to rank them, 1 through 16, in their bracket. I asked you, hey, what movies do you want to see in the bracket? So I'm going to basically take the first 16 movies that uh, you all mentioned for football that uh, happened today, and I'm going to th- throw those in the flick chart, see where they're ranked, and that'll give us our 1 through 16 ranking. And then what what we're going to do is, is Chris and I are going to talk about those movies. We'll probably pick two or three every week, maybe four every week. 
uh, matchups that we're going to talk about. And then we'll just talk about which one's our favorite. And, and if we agree, that movie gets to move on. If we disagree, then we're going to kick it to you all and let you vote on what you all think is the better movie until we reach the number one sports movie according to the OHIO podcast and its listeners. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So be on the lookout for that. We might even get that started next week, depending on uh, what, how much time I have this week. Uh, I've mentioned it before, Chris. Um, it's our birthday, man. Today, this week, we, we are now two years old here at the OHIO podcast, man. Um, a lot of people we need to thank. I'm not going to get into all of that. I'll do that personally with all of you behind the scenes, but I will say this, all of you who listen to the podcast and and who participate on our social media pages, I want to thank each and every single one of you. We have 5,582 followers on our, on our, uh, business Facebook page over on our, um, on our fans page, uh, which is where you all can post and, and, and make, you know, anything you want that's Buckeye related. Uh, we have upwards of one one thousand six hundred and something, something like that, over on Twitter. Yes, we have a Twitter page as well, um, which is is ran by um, Corey Johnson, which I do want to thank him for basically manhandling that for us, since uh, I'm not on Twitter at all. Uh, we have um, one thousand twelve followers on Twitter, so thank you, Corey, for taking that. We have an Instagram page with hundred and twenty seven followers. And we're also on MeWe as well, and uh, we've got quite the the, the growing uh, group uh, on MeWe. We actually are all the way up to 763 over there now as well. So we've got our bases covered, Chris, when it comes to social media and getting the word out about our podcast. Oh, by the way, uh, we have up over 11,000 and like 300 downloads at this point as well for our podcast. So we want to thank each and every single one of you who take the time to listen to us each and every single week here on the show. That was a lot of, a lot of thank yous there, Chris. I'm done with that, but Hey, happy birthday, man. We're two. I'm telling you, I think that once the governor, you know, lifts these restrictions, I think we ought to have us a birthday bash. That'd be a lot of fun, man. That'd be that'd be a lot of fun. I, I definitely want to take this show out on the road more uh, here in Delaware, there in Marion. That was one of the reasons why I was so excited to have you join us, Chris, was to have someone local with me. Uh, it was it was great having Aaron, and I can't wait to have Aaron back. Um, I, I know he's overseas. He was uh, uh, and doing his tour of duty over there, and and a big thank you shout out goes to Aaron for for his service, uh, keeping us safe doing what he's got to do for the United States military overseas. And I, I can't wait to get him back, but uh, it's been nice having you local, Chris, because when this thing's done, man, I do, I want to get out there and, and, and mingle with the people and grow this thing locally a little bit more. We have a lot of listeners, but believe it or not, I get the stats. The majority of our listeners are not from central Ohio, believe it or not. They're from around the state and even beyond. We have a lot of listeners from out of state, who want to keep up on the Buckeyes, even though they don't live in Ohio. And so that's how they choose to do it is through outlets like ours. And we appreciate that, but I want to get some more of that local feel, brother. I can't help it. Oh, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I'll tell you what, you know, when, it, when time comes, uh, you know, we'll find some local places here. I'm sure that would uh, love to have us come in and uh, do a show. Of course, you know, we're always happy to, host the show down at the Ohio State store and lots more. Uh, and then, like you said, I, I mean, I know some uh, local watering holes in the area who I'm sure would be more than happy to have us in there. Yeah, we'll get uh, – one of the things we're going to do is going to be getting some really nice uh, equipment. Uh, that's one of the things that's coming up. Uh, YouTube's coming our way, people. That is going to be happening. I've been working on some YouTube things and uh, learning how to do that. So that's going to be on your way, some, some cool videos there. And uh, some nice equipment to, so that when we do go out on the road, we've got speakers and microphones. And one of the things that we were going to do last year that got set aside because of COVID was the spring. We were going to have a really awesome uh, spring game meet down at the stadium and tailgate with all the, all of you. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen again this year, sounds like. But 
that doesn't mean that we can't have a, a, a season kickoff show in Marion and Delaware where we go out and maybe bring in some some local Buckeyes and some people to meet with all of you and get their takes on things and and maybe maybe call up Jack Park, have him come and join us. Yeah, that's a local favorite of everybody's to talk about the Buckeyes. But uh, we're looking forward to it. We're going to get into it. We're going to have some interviews with some Buckeyes over the summer as well. Um, so be looking for that. But we are excited about everything that's coming in the next year. And it's exciting to be number two. We are not slowing down. We're only getting bigger and better, Chris, and that's the way I like it. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Um, you know, I'm eager eager for Aaron to get back, so we got our uh, our trio back together. But, uh, you know, he, he never misses a chance to give us the, uh, the tough questions from overseas. So I kind of feel like he's still here with us. Yeah. But, but you know, I, I, you know, it's been a great, uh, great time being a part of uh, the podcast in, in his absence and, and look forward to it moving forward. Yeah, last I heard, I believe he is scheduled to come back um, from overseas by the middle to end of summer. So right about time the season kicks off, All we right. should expect to be hearing Aaron back, hopefully. And yeah, I'm with you, Chris. There's nothing better than a three-man weave uh, when it comes to podcasting and talking about the Buckeyes. There's just that's that's the sweet spot right there, man. It's always good to have that tiebreaker. There it is. There it is. All right, guys. So a lot of good things coming your way. Be on the lookout for that. Uh, make sure you're connected to our Facebook page and our other pages so that uh, you can be tied down with everything that we've got coming your way. So much, so much good stuff, guys. So be on the lookout of that. All right, guys. That's our show for today. Be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH in St. Carmen, Ohio with all your heart. And until next time, OH! Hello! Go Bucks. Oh, come, let's sing, oh, praise and songs through Alma Mater while our hearts rebounding thrill. And joy which death alone can still. Summer's heat, oh, oh, winter's cold. The seasons pass, the years will roll. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship. Oh, hi, oh.